You might not have noticed, but there's a massive new hole in the moon. They found a new crater! What? Where? This crater was caused by junk. Space junk. That tiny dot you see blinking in the middle of the screen is a chunk of metal the size of a bus. It's hurtling through space at 9,300 kilometres per hour. That's nearly eight times the speed of sound. NASA calculated from its trajectory and distance that it was a booster from this Chinese rocket that launched almost a decade ago in China's Lunar Exploration Program, a claim that China denies. So a few months ago, that piece of metal disappeared on the far side of the moon. And then suddenly, boom, there it was. A brand new crater, double-barreled. That's two overlapping craters, so big they could fit a few semi-trailers inside. It's the first time a piece of man-made material is known to have accidentally hit the moon. So what's the big deal, right? The moon's full of craters. Well, the problem's not so much the craters, it's the space junk. There's so much of it flying around up there, it's starting to become a bit of a problem. So what do we do about it? And whose job is it to clean it up? All right, let's take it back to the beginning. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the world's first satellite, Sputnik 1. It was only the size of a beach ball, but when the Russians shot this silver sphere into space, the world stopped in awe. One of the great scientific feats of the age. It circled the planet every 90 minutes, transmitting a simple beeping signal that was heard in country after country for three weeks before it ran out of battery. And although it was eventually dragged back to Earth by gravity two months later and burned up in the atmosphere, the space age was born. Since then, we've put another 13,000 satellites up there, along with spacecraft for exploration, moon missions and Mars landings. More recently, private companies have entered the space race, and the number of launches per year is rising astronomically. Every time one of these spacecraft takes off, parts of the rocket are shed and discarded in orbit. Stage separation confirmed. And satellites eventually run out of juice. For decades, it was just cheaper to leave them out there than to retrieve or refuel them. After all, space has a lot of, you know, space. But these days, to get there, we have to dodge all that junk that's collected over the years. Gravity is what keeps it hovering close to Earth. It also helps us clean up some of it. Atmospheric drag eventually pulls things within Earth's orbit back to the ground, burning it up on the way in through friction with the atmosphere, which is why we sometimes get a spectacular sky show. Uh, if you have a chance to look out of the window, look out of the window, because the view is spectacular. spectacular. But not everything comes back. Gravity's pull weakens the further you go out, so space junk 400 kilometres from Earth, where the International Space Station orbits, would take about 25 years to return. If you double that distance to 800 kilometres, where most of our satellites are, it could be 150 years before it hits Earth's atmosphere. And if you go another 400 kilometres out from there, so 1,200 kilometres from Earth, a piece of junk could happily float out there for about 2,000 years. So a lot of old rocket parts and dead satellites are still up there, spinning uncontrolled around Earth, along with other debris like lost equipment, nuts and bolts, fragments of collisions, flecks of fuel, and even an electric car. You can thank Elon Musk for that little stunt. Space agencies are currently tracking more than 36,000 bits of space junk, measuring more than 10 centimetres in length. That's the big stuff. It's estimated there's more than 1 million pieces measuring between 1 and 10 centimetres in length. And there are a staggering 130 million bits smaller than a centimetre. Even something as tiny as this can do some serious damage. In 2016, a fleck of paint did this, took a chip out of some reinforced glass on the International Space Station. Things are going really fast in space, up to 7 or 8 kilometres a second. If things collide with each other, then the consequences can be pretty fatal and catastrophic. 
The problem with space junk is that it could set off a chain reaction that would have some pretty big consequences for life on Earth. The Kessler syndrome describes a destructive domino effect where one collision sets off another, which then causes another, shredding satellites and spacecraft into clouds of debris with no way for us to stop it. The research has actually shown that even if we don't put up anything into space anymore, so we stop sending satellites into space, the collisions will be ongoing and there will be more and more collisions over time. This phenomenon is a worst case scenario where space debris forms an impassable barrier around the planet. So what would it mean? Well think, no weather maps, no satellite communications or GPS directions, or even another way to send a rocket into space. Some theorists believe that effect is already slowly in motion. And so, you know, we talk about the Kessler syndrome, which is when space debris crashing with space debris creates this self-sustaining cascade of, of collisions. And you know, most of orbital space is a long way off from that, but that 850 to 880 kilometre band is actually really close if we're not there already. We already know of 630 breakages and collisions, some of them much worse than others. One of the biggest happened in 2007, when China deliberately blew up one of its weather satellites about 865 kilometers from Earth. China said it was just testing out a new anti-satellite missile. The missile obliterated the satellite and in the process created more than 3,000 new fragments bigger than a golf ball and another estimated 100,000 smaller bits. Six years later, one of those fragments hit and broke a Russian satellite. Then in 2009, a US satellite called Iridium and a Russian satellite called Cosmos collided, creating a cloud of debris made of at least 2,000 pieces. Thousands of fragments from these collisions are still in orbit. And avoiding them is tricky. As space travel opens up, we're also working on new technologies like telescopes that can show fast-moving fragments instead of traditional telescopes that only work with slow-moving stars, or sensitive lenses that can see objects in the evening sky before the sun goes down. We're even making lasers that can reach into space and push objects around. EOS, based at Mount Stromlo Observatory just outside Canberra, is a global leader in these lasers. It's an Australian company specialising in defence, space and communications technology. So, we're trying to stop collisions happening between space debris objects. So we don't, we're not trying to deorbit things, so we don't have to bring it down. We just have to change the velocity, so that if you're going to have a crash, you just need to slow one down slightly so they pass in the night. So they track debris that's moving faster than the speed of sound and then give it a little nudge out of the way. At EOS, we take the entire catalogue of known objects and compute their orbits for seven days in advance to see which objects are coming close to each other and then we will focus on those. Then, then we were looking at 42,000 close approaches within five kilometres per week. The lasers work best on debris between 10 and 30 centimetres in length, but the science is developing quickly. It's only a matter of time before the lasers are strong enough to reach further into space and move bigger objects out of the way. So here's an idea. Why not put one of these lasers onto the spacecraft so it can move the debris out of its own path? One person's laser ablation tool for debris is another person's laser weapon. A laser in orbit would be considered a space weapon, which would make it illegal under the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. Arm the laser! Arm in the laser! There are some explicit rules in the treaties about what you can and can't put there. They don't go as far as some of us would like, but what they do say is you can't put a weapon of mass destruction or a nuclear weapon in space. There are also rules about responsibility for damage and debris, but who enforces them is unclear. The Outer Space Treaty doesn't have a, an international space force that's going to come in and, um, or a police force that's going to come and enforce. Calling space headquarters. Our mission has been successfully completed and we're returning to Earth. Even without enforcement, there's a good reason to stick to the rules. If we mess up space for someone else, we are going to be messing up space um, for ourselves as well. 
Some organisations are already working on ways to get rid of the mess up there, but it isn't easy or cheap. The European Space Agency has partnered with a Swiss startup to retrieve a part of their Vega rocket from this launch in 2013. It's the world's first space mission to pick up junk, and it'll be another three years before it's ready to take off. It's very complex performing the rendezvous and capture of a satellite that was not designed to be uh, captured. That is not cooperative. I mean, some of the objects are spinning at three, five degrees per second. First, it has to reach and then match the exact orbit and speed of that piece of the Vega rocket. Then it'd have to release robotic arms to grab the rocket cone. That's 110 kilograms spinning at high speed. From there, it'd have to drag it back towards Earth where they both burn up completely on re-entry. The big challenge I think in the future will be uh, how do we get funding to remove other objects? The alternative is to just leave the junk up there, which would be just as costly. So if we have more pieces out there, more pieces have to be managed, more pieces have to be tracked, and there will be more collision warnings. And it's basically the workload will increase, and so that will cost a lot more to maintain and run those networks and also upgrade them and increase the capability of tracking all those things. In the race among billionaire chiefs to make space travel commercial, keeping costs down has led to a great innovation, reusable rockets. And touchdown! Jeff Bezos came out in front. His company, Blue Origin, launched and returned the first reusable rocket in 2015. Elon Musk soon followed with Falcon 9 after SpaceX's many, many, many attempts. Experimental rockets are the, are the absolute, are just utterly stupid, in my opinion. Utterly stupid. Um, they're a complete waste of time. People should stop wasting their time. It would be an absurd thing for them to sell a single-use aircraft, but they feel quite comfortable selling a single-use rocket. Rocket bodies are the biggest thing we send up into space, so making them reusable goes some way towards helping with the space junk problem. But what about satellites? Right now there are 8,500 of these orbiting around us, and about a third of them no longer work. Two dead satellites can't avoid each other. When one of these satellites fails, it's now in a very uh, populated region and we need to make sure it doesn't pose a risk to other satellites. At least 24,000 satellites are set to launch in the next 10 years. A growing number of companies are building what they call mega constellations to have cheaper, faster broadband internet everywhere on Earth. OneWeb is launching 36 satellites at a time to reach its goal of having 7,000 of them up there. And those sky trains of stars you might have seen that's Elon Musk's ambitious plan to get 12,000 Starlink probes into orbit. So very similar to other tech industries, the space industry is undergoing what I term a pacing problem, which is the notion of differences between the exponential increase in advancements of technology and innovation compared to the slow progression of regulatory guidelines and norms of behaviour. A group of international agencies is trying to catch up, developing a space sustainability rating to ensure sustainable satellite practices. We wanted to develop a rating system that assessed how sustainable a space mission was, but also recognised and rewarded actors who were taking steps in order to really pursue sustainable actions and operations in space. There's no doubt that space law and space lawyers have a lot to grapple with in the years and decades to come. There's one thing about being in Space Patrol, there's never a dull moment. It's a new kind of space race, a race to clean it up.